Hello everyone, this is Kathleen Chirani with Autism Brainstorm and today I have a fabulous guest that's John Elder Robeson and um, John is the author of two fabulous books already, Look Me in the Eye and um, I'm sorry John, what's the name of your other book? Um, well we have Be Different and Be now different. the newest one Raising Cubby. Right, that's what we're here to talk about. Be different, uh, look me in the eye. And Raising Cubby is just an amazing book. Um, the publisher sent it to me, John, and I read it in like one night. I just couldn't put it down. It's, um, it's, it's humorous, it's interesting, it gives um, a very good view, a very good perspective of someone who's on the spectrum. And um, it's just fun. It's a fun, fun book. And you did a fabulous job. Um, woof. Woof, indeed. Quite woof worthy. Um, there are several stories that I'm going to share that I know are already out there, so I'm not giving out too much information about your book, but they're just really um, fun and entertaining stories. Um, First of all, I would just uh, like to say something that I wrote the other day that I would like to, to share. And um, I think this sums up my feelings is that this memoir of John's life tells some very heart-wrenching, difficult facts from the life of someone on the spectrum. And he told it with thoughtfulness and humor. He shares how he grew as a person, as a man, as a father, and how he raised a son on the spectrum in a very nurturing, free-range manner which nurtured him intellectually and emotionally as well. I read it. I love it. Um, I highly recommend it for not just folks on the spectrum who will get the humor the way that other people just probably can't. Um, for folks who lived with loved ones on the spectrum and will just laugh and say, oh my gosh, this is, this is how you know, my loved one is. And uh, for neurotypical people who just want a highly entertaining, humorous book that is touching. Um, it's a real life story, a real view from the behind the eyes of um, one of the most interesting uh, autism authors that there is. Um, and uh, that's how I uh, viewed Raising Cubby. It's just a it's just a fun read. It's an informative read, and it connects people. It connects people. Um, John, one of the stories um, that uh, I would like to share is on baby naming. And uh, the excerpt from the book is, if we ended up with a girl, I favored naming her Thugwina. Because yeah. I knew a girl named Thugwina would be tough and not be hassled by bullies. Lillian or Anne had nothing on Thugwina. In fact, if they were to meet Thugwina in a dark alley one night far in the future, they would surely turn and run. Um, Little Bear, um, uh, Cubby's mother, didn't like that name much at all. She even rejected my functional choices. He would outgrow baby pretty fast, but kids seem perfectly suitable and admirably descriptive to me. Um, Thugwina, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Is that a true story? Is that just a fun story? Oh, it's a true story, absolutely, yeah. I, I thought that that would be a fine name if I had a baby girl, yes. Don't you think so? Well, it would certainly make her tough. That's right. <laughs> it's like that boy named Sue thing in the Johnny Cash song. It surely is in gender reversal. Yeah. That's fun stuff. That's fun oh. stuff. <laughs> okay, um, here's another fun one. Um, you said to Cubby on buying him at the kids store. Actually, I won't read this story. Do you want to just share about the kids store? Well, the, the kids store is its just... Uh, it's the uh, the one thing that every child will believe and uh -huh. know to be true when he starts asking these basic questions. Uh -huh. When a kid gets old enough to uh, do more than say yes and no and food and drink, mm -hmm. he's going to ask where he came from. Right. And, uh, some people will say, well, you know, Stork brought you, or God brought you, or you grew inside a mom. Uh -huh. but I just knew that the thing he would instinctively recognize and know to be true mm -hmm. was, Cubby, I bought you at the kid's store. <laughs> <laughs> 
No. So actually, actually, I'm going to read this. This is just funny. And the thing that I really enjoyed most is um, the the feeling that you left him with. Um, okay, here is here is verbatim. You were stuck to the window in a big display basket, looking out at the shoppers as they walked through the mall. Your mom thought you were really cute, and I thought you'd grow up to be a hard worker around the house. They had you out there on display because you were the best looking kid they had, and stores always put their best stuff out on display. Um, they wanted to give me a wrapped kid from the stock in the back, but I knew you were probably the best specimen. So I insisted on the display model, and here you are. Now, I think a lot of people might say, oh, what a story to tell a kid, but you know what? Who wouldn't want to be the best specimen in the store? That's right, yeah, I and mean, then he was the <laughs> next to the most expensive, and the only kid in there that cost more was one of the ones with three eyes, and those kids are mostly just used in mining. You don't usually see them in suburban homes. Well, they're pretty rare, too, I would think. So they well, might if you go to mining communities, place. they're common, but not where most people are. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, now, on marking Cubby's foot with a Sharpie, did you do that, John? Did you mark his foot with a Sharpie? I did, because... I wasn't sure what would happen after he hatched. When he was, uh -huh. you know, born, that was my first experience with a kid. Uh -huh. And I knew they had these nurseries in hospitals, mm -hmm. and I wasn't sure if they put the babies, like on trays, under warming lamps like they do food in the cafeteria. Right. I thought that they might, like, all be, like, in a big room where they were... Um, monitored by nurses and warmed under heat lamps. Uh -huh. and I thought that if something like that happened, there was a risk that I could lose track of which baby was mine. So I marked him because I knew that there was no other way to recognize him. Uh huh. Well, you have a, a fun extension of that story that I'd like to share. Um, you said, I had not inspected the baby holding facility at Cooley Dickinson Hospital before that night. And for all I know, it was just a big open pen like the Sunderland fish hatchery. And there was no way you could tell one fish from another without a slime proof marker. I had looked at the other kids in the ward and none of them were solidly tagged. Did baby swaps happen often? For all I knew, depraved nurses shuffled babies for entertainment. That was something I might do if I were bored, a bored maternity nurse late at night. I'm scared of you, John. <laughs> would you really do <laughs> If you were bored, well, I think that many people would do that late at night if they had the opportunity. I, I just admitted it. I don't think that's that unusual. <laughs> uh, that is definitely something to think about now. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. On getting Cubby to go to sleep, I had read in a child rearing book that tiring monologues were effective, but that was easier said than done. I tried reading him stock prices from the Wall Street Journal. My hope was it would not only put him to sleep, but increase his financial prowess. Now I can see that. However, he got bored after 10 minutes or so and began complaining nonstop. I tried civil engineering thrillers, like the history of Hoover Dam and the building of the interstate highways, but they had the opposite effect from what I intended. They woke him up. He wiggled his ears and asked questions. Um, pretty good. Pretty good. Um, I will have to say that my husband is a civil engineer. And um, when I was reading little bits of this to him, um, so he really doesn't have an awful lot of interest in um, the work that I do, which is fine. Um, but this really piqued his interest. Um, the way that you tell the story that goes from humor into reality and back seamlessly <laughs> is intriguing. Um, he was very, very impressed with your with your storytelling ability, and and so am I. It's just well, a, you say it goes from reality and back. <laughs> I don't think it ever left reality. I think that was a very practical <laughs> approach to putting a kid to sleep. Oh, that one is yes. That one I buy. That one makes sense for sure. I think it all makes sense. Marking <laughs> it with a marker makes sense. 
You don't know what's going to happen. Your kid could get whisked away from you just after being born and pull well, now that's you know true. It, you got some other kid back. That's true. That's true. Okay, how about I wasn't going to go here, but how about the Santa story? Well, <clears throat> the Cubby book mm -hmm. uh, reveals for the first time in a you know in a book like this uh -huh. the truth about some of the some of the sides of Santa that people don't know. Uh -huh. and, and it answers some questions that many children have wondered all their lives. Uh -huh. For example, where does the coal come from? Everyone hears that Santa will give you coal if you're not nice. Uh -huh. Where does he get the coal? And right. in this book, I talk about Cubby and I going to visit the source of the coal. Mm -hmm. And many other things that we do. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the Santa story, and mm -hmm. there are several other stories like it, are mm -hmm. actually suitable for parents to read to their own children, just as they are, right, in the Raising Cubby book. Mm. Well, so it's I like having two or three children's books for free. It is. Books. It is. I agree with that. And you know what? Children's books for, our, uh, for adults as well. They're, they're fun reads. For regardless of where you're at on the spectrum, off the spectrum, or your age, they're just there. There's something in there for everybody. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, okay. Let's talk about persuading Cubby to wash dishes. That's a good practical thing. I looked forward to the day Cubby would deliver me to a state of domestic bliss by doing all the household chores and cooking too. Sadly, that never happened, though I did get him to wash the dishes. He was reluctant at first regarding dirty dishes, dirty plates, excuse me, as too toxic to handle. But our new home was only a quarter mile from an old landfill. And I warned Cubby that rats came out of the landfill at night looking for food scraps. I reminded him of the television shows that showed rats chewing through walls and looked pointedly at his bare feet. After that, getting Covey to wash dishes was never a problem. Now, oh. that's interesting. That's an interesting way, and it was apparently effective. It worked. Now, not everybody lives near an abandoned landfill, but uh -huh. there are certainly rats in almost every community in the country, and I think that making your child aware that if he leaves food out, he could be eaten by rats. You know, that's a reasonable thing to, to warn him about. That's a real incentive, for sure. It is, yeah. No kid wants to be eaten by rats. No, absolutely not. Okay, let's talk about having a teenager. Teenagers are very different animals from little kids. Little Bear and I found that out, found that out when Cubby was about 14 or 15 and began making plans of his, plans of his with new Amherst friends. We parents weren't included. Actually, we weren't even consulted. With every passing day, he was becoming more and more determined to run his own life. Parents who were once founts of knowledge became dumb as rocks overnight. Not only were we stupid, we were uncooperative, embarrassing, and totally useless. It was nice to be needed. Okay. Well, that's, I think, how many kids feel Mm -hmm. I certainly don't think that I'm unique in describing that sentiment. Anyone who has had one or more teenagers should surely recognize it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things that, um, that's really all the stories that I'm going to share from the book, John, because, I mean, there's, there are a lot of them, but uh, I don't want to give away too many. Um, one of the things that really intrigued me about the book was the feeling of, um, warmth that I think that maybe the broader community doesn't really understand because the way that many people on the spectrum uh, express themselves might be different than than how they're they're used to in their typical environments but um, what what comes across from the book is just how concerned that you all are as a family about the raising of Cubby and it was really a family affair, wasn't it? It wasn't just John raising Cubby. It was um, an amazing, um, um, supportive family environment that you created. 
Well, it certainly wasn't uh, just me. His right. mother mm -hmm. did uh, a lot of the uh, difficult and dirty work, the mm -hmm. diaper changing and, you know, having him pee on her and stuff like that. He, mm -hmm. he did most of that. And mm -hmm. I took him places that sort of expanded his mind and, and showed him new things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it was a cooperative effort, I guess. And, and mm -hmm. I'd like to think that most parents who raise kids, you know, have a similar kind of objective in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, I really, um, I'll just mention very briefly that you gave a very nice tribute, I thought, to Mary Pat and the fact that, that she has helped um, make a very cohesive um, unit you know, out of your whole family. And I've, I've personally found that very, very, one of the most touching parts of the book. Well, I think that that's a kind of a cool thing, that she mm -hmm. and Cubby's mom are, are best of friends, and they yes, all that's amazing. have dinner mm -hmm. together here at the house on Sunday nights. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a kind of a nice thing. I never really knew that before in life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Yeah. Yeah, it was it was very it was very eye opening. It was very touching, and um, you gave a very very real and um, um, an open sharing of every part of your family uh, and your 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 history in raising Cubby. Um, now there was one particular story about um, Cubby where, and I think it's pretty common knowledge, where he had some difficulty with the law. And it was really from a very innocent um, action on his part, actually his uh, interest in chemistry. Did you want to talk about that very much? or? Well, I, I think that is an important thing for people to talk about. It's mm -hmm. really every parent's worst nightmare that their kid would do something a little out of the ordinary mm -hmm. and other people in the community might see the kid doing something mm -hmm. and sometimes you run across morally bankrupt people in positions of power people in the uh, you know in the in the court system people in yes. law enforcement yes and uh, they may decide that they could advance their career or get their name in lights uh, by ruining your kid or someone in your family. And I think that's a very real fear that many, many people have in the United States. And, and indeed, that's what happened with Cubby. Mm -hmm. uh, Cubby became interested in chemistry at an early age, and just about every kid who becomes interested in chemistry at age 13 wants to try experimenting with explosives. Mm -hmm. And Cubby was like any other kid, but he was... Uh, autistic, so he concentrated maybe more deeply. He maybe became better at it, and I think that by the time he was 16, he had a, an extraordinarily sophisticated knowledge of the chemistry and physics of explosives. And when his YouTube videos of his experiments um, came to the attention of uh, folks at the ATF, they thought that he was a you know a young genius, and he could have a a bright future as a government chemist. I think that uh, the local district attorney thought that she could save her reputation by pretending to save the community from a terrorist. And of course, the terrorist became my kid, even though he had no history of being in trouble with anyone before for anything. Right. And I would like to mention, too, that what he had in his possession were very common items. Well, he had made uh, explosives from ordinary mm -hmm, household mm -hmm. chemicals. Nothing that he bought was uh, illegal or hazardous or... Right, I did want to point that out. It's not like he was sitting there with some very, you know, um, things that were, were purchased out of the ordinary in order to have an extremely, you know, um, deadly bomb. Yeah, and, and he didn't have any bombs either. All he ever did was mix up explosive compounds and uh, set them off, you know, on the ground in the woods outside to see what they would do. Mm -hmm. They were never packaged into, uh, 
into destructive devices and uh, there was nothing ever damaged by them. They just set stuff off on the ground. Right, exactly. And, and the idea that somehow that could be twisted mm -hmm. into serious felony charges on a par with armed robbery or attempted murder for a yes. kid who was 16 and 17 years old, that was just crazy and outrageous. Yes, but and I'm reading... all too real. That happens to families all over this country when they run across the wrong people. That is a very, very serious, serious issue. Um, I'm reading here where it says that Cubby was facing up to 60 years in prison over such a such a such an insignificant thing that that is that is terrifying it's it's terrifying and and you know the other thing it, it shows you is uh, it shows you how far sometimes these local prosecutors can run off the rails because in our community we have real crime we have house yes. breaks we have mm -hmm. rapes we have assaults we have major thefts mm -hmm. and they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars of taxpayer yes. resources yes. to go after my son, which was a, a total right. waste. Well, um, not, not to mention... All those resources mm -hmm. were diverted mm -hmm. from the solving of real crimes. And I argue that the reason they did that is they thought the pursuit of a so-called terrorist would get their name in the paper where nobody really cares about somebody right. who steals five cars or breaks into two houses. Right. Right. Um... Uh, I, I don't know. This is that. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. That uh, and not only the expense to the taxpayer. Let's. Um, this was very devastating for you personally. Oh, it was a huge thing for me. And and I think that if I had not had a successful business mm -hmm. and had the resources to fight this, we'd have just been sunk. We would have had no choice but to plead guilty. And and I think that that's what the state relies on so much of the time they they have such a crushing uh, weight that they bring to bear on people that f even innocent people just cave in under the weight of it because they feel that they can't possibly defend themselves mm-hmm mm -hmm. um, hmm. are you involved in any groups that are they're discussing um, any type of remedy for this in the future do you know of anything that's going on in the community I'm not really aware of people discussing it, but mm -hmm. I think it's something that needs to be talked about. We talk about uh, educating first responders and law enforcement, for example, so that they respond appropriately yes. if they encounter autistic people, say, at a, at a crime scene or a big crowd where the police gather or an accident right. where the police arrive. Right. But um, there's a much larger problem of uh, holding public officials accountable for their actions mm -hmm. when they make misjudgments. And I, and I don't even think this is a misjudgment. I think this was a calculated judgment yes. on the part of the prosecutor who thought that she could win publicity for herself by going after my kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because she is a newsworthy case. Right. Now, she's no longer in that position, correct? No, they uh, kind of you know ran him out of office. There was, she had a, a series of... Uh, of bad calls and uh, and she mm. left office. That's that was that was for the best. That's good. Um, but as far as what what you came out of pocket on, John, um, any any uh, possibility of compensation on that? No, that's something that's really very disturbing because yes, it's very common for the state to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions sometimes in these prosecutions. Mm -hmm. And if you're the defendant, your cost to defend yourself is not a whole lot less. Where are you going to get the money to do that? The average person can't afford to defend themselves now. No, they cannot. And, you know, and it's a system where people face ruin even if they win. Wow. And, and we have no recourse to the state. You know, it's in, in some countries... If somebody brings a frivolous lawsuit mm -hmm. and they lose, they become liable for the other side's court costs, and that really puts a damper on the filing of frivolous suits. Certainly, yes. We ought to have that in this country, but what we also ought to have is accountability of public prosecutors, that if, if they make 
serious misjudgments like this that they should be held liable. I, I think that a prosecutor would think twice about going forward with a, you know, a case like my son's if she thought that she might face censure and her office might be assessed a few hundred thousand dollars in defense costs. Mm -hmm. Or at I least think that would absolutely make them think twice. Right. Or at least do an investigation of exactly what were the um, the circumstances that led them to choose to pursue it. I almost don't think the circumstances matter. I think that uh, the um, you know the vote of the jury certainly mm -hmm. made the public's view of the case very clear. Yes. And I think that given that result, mm -hmm. it, it was a serious uh, error of judgment on the part of the prosecutor, and the reasons for it ultimately don't matter. I think they should still be held accountable for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying. Um, well, hopefully, just raising Cubby will um, open up a dialogue. Well, we'll have to see. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm waiting to see what happens as the book moves out into the world and people begin to read it. I wonder what people will make of it and what they'll say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because even though that it has a lot of a lot of humor, both intended and unintended, um, um, and it's it's very it's a very engaging read. That is the serious aspect of the book. And um, I think that it could very well do what it is that you're that you're uh, uh, pointing out needs to be done, which is have a discussion about about these things. Um, well, I is certainly there, hope so, and mm -hmm. we'll just have to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I could certainly see you doing um, um, uh, seminars, speeches, um, in, in lots and lots of different types of venues. To, uh, to get this ball rolling about this conversation. Yeah, that, that might indeed happen. Certainly, uh, Look Me in the Eye mm -hmm. uh, led to me being uh, invited to speak about uh, autism and Asperger's mm -hmm. and growing up all over. And mm -hmm. this book certainly continues in that vein with a, a guy on the spectrum raising a kid on the spectrum, but also this... Uh, new dialogue about uh, justice and people with differences. Yes. Uh, that's a whole new thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I do want to mention um, in the Cover It Live uh, module that, it, that this is going to be attached to. I have your websites listed, but I want to mention them here just in case someone's watching on YouTube and doesn't have access to that module. That um, you're, you have a blog on Psychology Today which can be found at psychologytoday.com slash experts slash John Elder Robeson. And you have some fabulous um, articles there that I enjoy reading very much. Um, John's blog is jerobeson.blogspot.com. Um, his website is www.johnrobeson.com, and you have something new, John, and I'm going to give that website and let you talk about it a little bit, and it is booksforbetterliving.com. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, books for Better Living is a, uh, an initiative of my publisher. Mm -hmm. They, um, you know, Random House is, of course, the uh, biggest... Uh, you know, the biggest trade book publisher in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, they have a, um, a website um, called booksforbetterlivinglive.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're doing this, uh, this thing that they, uh, well, they say, imagine what it would be like if you could live the life you've always pictured for yourself, the one in which you feel completely alive and fulfilled in every way. Unlimited happiness, uh, self-love, improved relationships, all in two weeks. And, and that's a series of um, uh, lectures and, and other content by me and, and a number of other mm -hmm. authors. Yeah, some very high-profile people, John. Right. Uh, yeah, we have, yeah, there's a, yeah certainly a, a list of, of impressive authors. Mm -hmm. And... Um, People can sign up right now, and they can download the um, the lectures as they come out uh, every mm -hmm. you know every day, starting March 18th, 
Deepak Chopra is mm -hmm. uh, first. Mm -hmm. And it just uh, goes on from there. I'm right. on March 25th. Good. And people can actually purchase the whole set of lectures and download them. And if they do that, they get other uh, bonus content, additional lectures. They get a uh, actually a screensaver of my uh, pictures for either a Mac or a PC. Mm -hmm. So uh, stuff like that comes with it, too. Wonderful, wonderful. One of the other... Um people who are experts who are involved is um, Byron Katie and she's one of my favorite authors. Um, Dr. Oh. Daniel Amen, wonderful, wonderful people contributing. Yeah. So this is a very wonderful thing. Okay, um, you also have, well, you have been involved in TMS for a while. I don't know if we necessarily want to go there. But Robeson Industries, do you want to talk about that a little bit? The company well, that uh, Covey has. Uh, Robeson Industries um, is uh, is a, a business that was uh, started by Cubby, my son, and mm -hmm. his mother, mm -hmm. and they are making uh, rep wraps, which are three D printers. Rep wraps are devices which extrude molten plastic, the way a, an inkjet printer might spit out ink, mm -hmm. and um, and they spit it out um, from a print head that moves in three dimensions so they can actually spit out plastic and they can build three-dimensional objects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a rep wrap can actually print a duplicate of itself. It's a really a cool technology. Yes, I was just going to say that I had just read that, um, that they actually are, are printing um, additional rep wraps. Yeah, it's really neat. And uh, <laughs> they're doing that and they're also working on making custom guitars because mm -hmm. ever since I you know left rock and roll mm -hmm. I would periodically get uh, queries from people asking if I could make a a guitar like you know this one or that one that we've made for famous musicians in the 70s mm -hmm. and <laughs> I always said no because I was kind of out of the business but now that Cubby has grown up mm -hmm. I realized that Cubby could do that and his mom could do that Mm -hmm. And so the two of them are actually accepting commissions and, and they're building uh, light guitars and smoking guitars and, you know, special effects guitars for Amazing. people who want, uh, want unusual stuff. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And who was, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not very good at uh, rock and roll uh, uh, folks' names, but someone had you refurbish their guitar and your uh, name... The 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 original thing I'm best known for is originally making all the guitars that uh, Ace Freely played in Kiss back yes. when they were yes. so big, uh -huh. and we do have uh, you know one of Ace's guitars actually in in the shop right now being refurbished that we took back from him last year. Mm -hmm. And what a cool thing that uh, that you had I don't know where I read this John it might have been on your on your on one of your blogs um, that you were would be happy to see that um, Cubby's name was going to be added because your name and Mary's name were already in the guitar and now Cubby would be um, added to that as well. Yeah, I think it's a kind of a cool thing that he is yeah. the same age now that I was when I originally designed those guitars. Uh huh. Uh huh. It's a cool thing, but, but a lot more efficient with these LED lights, huh? It's way more efficient, yeah. The guitars in the 70s could only run, you know, five minutes or so, um, mm -hmm. the whole hour with the incandescent lights. Right. Now with the LED technology, they'll play, you know, 30, 40 minutes on smaller battery packs. Mm -hmm. It's quite mm -hmm. impressive, the difference in efficiency. Right. And you also said that they had to, to, to do the timing with with something. There were there was some kind of a sound effect that would happen, and they had to time it with the with the drummers. Well, what happened with the original light guitar is it took so much uh, electrical power uh -huh. to turn on those lights <clears throat> mm -hmm. that when the lights fired, you would hear a pop through the uh, guitar's pickup. Mm -hmm. So so as the um, light patterns changed, it would go pop, 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 pop as the lighting changed. Mm -hmm. And pop, pop, pop had to be synchronized to the beat of the drum, so it didn't sound good. I weird. see. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Now the efficiency of the LED lights is so much higher that mm -hmm. they don't make any noise. And and you can do anything you want with it. You can speed it up, slow it down, or whatever, and 
you don't hear it come through the speakers. You just see it. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a way better performing system. Awesome. Awesome. Now, if people are interested in purchasing a RipRap um, or in um, this light guitar technology, how would they go about contacting Cubby? Uh, they can go to uh, robusonindustries.com. Okay. And um, they could even find us on uh, Facebook. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm John Elder Robeson on Facebook, and he's Jack Robeson, and his mom is Mary Robeson on Facebook. Very good, very good, and that's how they would get information. Um, real quickly, right before we leave, John, you're doing a conference. I'm going to pull up that flyer real fast. In May, and um, Temple's going to be presenting, um, our friend Dr. Stephen Shore, Eustacia Cutler, um, lots and lots and lots of people, but you. And what is it that you're going to be presenting on in uh, Pensacola in May? I'm going to pull up that flyer. I don't really know. I'll have to ah. see what people uh, are interested in. I, I never right. really know. I uh, I'll probably you. be doing, you know, 20 or 30 talks between now and May, and, and I don't uh -huh. really have a, an agenda for any of them. Okay, I got gotcha. you. And I'm having difficulty pulling that flyer up, so we'll let it be anyway. But an interesting side note is that uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. is going to be a special guest there, and there's just all kinds of fun things going on. So from that's from May 13th through the 15th in Pensacola, Florida. And Anita Lesko is the uh, coordinator of that event. And uh, people who would like information on that can go to autismpensacola.org and pre-register for that conference as yeah. well. What I'm do you have? I'm actually only uh -huh. going to be there for the last day because I have a commitment for a, a World Health Organization committee mm. in uh, Stockholm at the beginning of the week. So I'm only going to make it for the last day. Oh, okay. Very good. Um, what do you have uh, going on in the near term, John? What, what do you have going on here in the next few weeks? Well, this um, this coming uh, Friday, which mm -hmm. will be, um, let's see, that will be um, March, uh, March 8th, I leave for Tucson. Mm -hmm. And uh, Saturday and Sunday is the Tucson Book Festival, which I gather draws quite a large number of people at the uh, university campus there. Uh -huh. um, then on Monday morning, the 11th, mm -hmm. I'll be appearing uh, live on morning television in Phoenix, and I'll mm -hmm. be speaking that evening at Changing Hands Bookstore in Tempe. Mm -hmm. Then the next day, the 12th, uh, that's the day Raising Cubby goes on sale all over the United States and Canada. Yeah, that's the big day. And, and I'll be uh, at uh, Tattered Covers Lodo Store in Denver. Mm -hmm. Then the following day, I'll be at Boswell Books in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And the next day, which will be Thursday the 14th, I'll mm -hmm. be at Odyssey Books in South Hadley, Massachusetts. Then wow. on the 15th, I'll be doing uh, radio shows actually most of the day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then... I start again. I, I do uh, Roman's Bookstore in Pasadena, California, the 18th. Mm -hmm. Book Passage in Corte Madera, California, the 19th. Mm -hmm. Capitola Book Cafe in Capitola, California, the 20th. Uh -huh. And Hennepin County Library um, will be, and that's in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and that will be on um, the 21st. And uh, then uh, the 26th. I'll be at Center College in Danville, Kentucky, mm -hmm. and um, and then uh, on April 1st, which is uh, Autism Awareness Day here, I'll be at the University of Massachusetts in uh, in Amherst. Mm -hmm. Then the um, 6th of April, I'll be at Northshire Books in um, in Manchester, Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, then the um, the 9th of April. We have the next meeting of the IAC, the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee for the oh, good. Secretary uh -huh. of Health and Human Services. That's going to be at the National Institutes of Health Campus in Bethesda. Mm -hmm. And then I'm speaking at Ivy Mount School in Rockville, Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then... Uh, so from now through, through April, you are one busy person. 
Yeah, so we have, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on. Then the 21st uh -huh. is the uh, Aspen Conference in New Jersey. And, uh, right, with Laura Sherry. Uh -huh. In Montreal, 26th, Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And the 27th, Ottawa. Then uh, 28 and 29 in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So if, wow. if anyone wants to follow that, you can uh, just type John Elder Robeson speaking schedule into Google, and my speaking schedule comes right up. Great, great. That's on your blog? Yeah, it's on the blog, but you can just Google that phrase, and, and it brings it right up, too. That's that's excellent. Now, last week you went to um, a showing. I'm, I'm going to just jump off topic for just a moment. Of the Tectonic Theater, um, and, uh, Andy Paris's production of The Laramie Project. Yeah. And um, I watched the HBO version for the first time after you posted about that, and I was just absolutely blown away. And what a fabulous job that they did with such a sensitive topic of, of uh, bringing humanity to all sides of, of, um, uh, of, of that particular. Uh, um, the, how would you describe it, John? Basically, it was just a story of a tragic event of someone who was beaten to death simply for being gay. And then the communities... Um, various reactions and there were surprisingly positive and very um, uplifting things that were brought to brought to bear from from the uh, from the play what was your take on that I think that the uh, discussion that followed the Matthew Shepard uh, murder mm -hmm. did change the way uh, many people in that community in Wyoming and indeed uh, all around the country uh, saw uh, gay people and, and their place in the community and, and mm -hmm. certainly um, I think it, it really uh, it really changed the way a lot of people see things. Mm -hmm. I think it brought out the humanity. Yeah, rather than, a, rather than a label. I think that it, was a, it, it would accomplished a good thing by doing that. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I just love that they're talking now about doing something similar in the autism community, which is really why I'm referencing it. Well, they actually uh, speculated that uh, Matthew Shepard might have been on the spectrum, too. I'm not sure what led them to think that. I don't have mm -hmm. any personal knowledge of him, but the... Uh, some of the folks involved with the play uh, speculated that when I was mm -hmm. uh, talking with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was very, I'm very hopeful that uh, someone's going to take a look at Cubby, raising Cubby, and seriously consider um, uh, developing that into some sort of stage play. How do you think that that would translate, John? I think that the Cubby story um, probably <coughs> lends itself pretty well to that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I I'd be very interested to see if somebody wants to turn it into a play or movie. Also, it's very hard to say what will happen. I mm -hmm. thought Look Me in the Eye might be a candidate for that also, but mm -hmm. nothing has uh, happened as yet. Although you just really don't know right. how long such a thing may right. take. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I definitely I definitely believe that uh, raising Cubby has that that uh, potential for sure. And hopefully, you know, woof. <laughs> Looking forward to, to seeing what's going to happen with the release on March the 12th. And, um, and all the wonderful things that you're doing. Once again, all these websites are going to be on Autism Brainstorm. They're going to be in the uh, um, Cover It Live module. And thank you so much, John. Thank you for writing such an entertaining and serious and meaningful book. Well, thank you for having me on with you to talk about it tonight. You're very, very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And please do check out Raising Cubby, coming to a bookstore near you. Woof. Woof. Night, everyone.